Welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my co-host. Kristen Flannery, also known as Lady Glockenflecken. You got a better name than I do. Well, can't help you. All right. Well, anyway, as we're, we're stuck with them at this point. That's right. Uh, it's your fault. You came up with it. I did. Um, so we just, we got through the holidays. We did it. We did it. Whew. It's That's never rough. When did it, at, at what age, at what point in our lives did it stop becoming like f- more fun and start becoming just like constant two weeks of chores? Yeah. Uh, I think probably, well, when they're little, it's still fun because it's like everything is magical and they've never seen any of it before and they don't have any expectations about how any of it happens and they can't remember it the following year. So you can just repeat. But now they're like, Re-gift, they have re-gift demands. Their toys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought think... about doing that this year <laughs> with all that stuff that they never play with. I'm yeah. sure they've forgotten about it. I thought about just wrapping it back up. Well, we're, we've been better about making sure they donate the things that they're not. That's right. They're not playing with Out anymore. with the old before to, in with the yeah, new. Bring, get, get other people an opportunity to enjoy the things that they don't enjoy anymore. And, exactly. Uh, but we did. We went to... Uh, Washington for a week. We did. We played in the snow. It was very fun. It was great. Now, uh, we both grew up in Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a native Texan. I am uh, not. Kristen I will not claim not. that, but I did get held there for my childhood. She did. Uh, that's where we met. We met in college at Texas Tech. But uh, uh, as a result of growing up in Texas, uh, we, neither of us did any kind of snow activities. No. Skiing ice skating no nothing one time we had an ice day and um my dad owned a dairy supply store and he tied uh, it's called a foot bath it's what it sounds like but it's for cows uh oh, that's nice yeah he tied that behind his truck and we sat in it and he pulled us around so that we could go sledding Are you that serious? was a different time <laughs> <laughs> okay it sounds extremely dangerous <laughs> it was and that is the extent of my winter activities, I think, as the a child. The point is, we did not ski in Washington. <laughs> no. Uh, it didn't even cross our minds. In fact, the only time I've ever been skiing, the one and only time, was in med school while we were at Dartmouth. It was like April, maybe even early May, like the worst time. No, it was spring break. It was March. Was it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, all I remember is that we went to this little dinky little like ski slope uh, close to where we lived. Two of my friends from Texas both had never skied before. The three of us showing up mm-hmm. to ski for the first time. Uh, no lessons. No, nope. nothing. You we're thought, like, oh, it can't ah, be that hard. It's not that hard. Let's just do it. Meanwhile, it's it's March in New Hampshire, and the the slope was just like ice. It's just like there's no powder. No, see, I know enough to say like powder. Like mm-hmm. I know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Uh, uh, just solid ice, ice sheet. Mm-hmm. And here we are, two, three, and three you gotta, guys. You got to paint the picture. Like you are six foot four, and just. About eighty percent arms and legs. That's true. Yeah, I, I'm I'm all limbs here, and um, and so I we we managed to get our gear on, and I, I kind of just maneuver myself over to the ski lift. There were not that many people there uh, on this day, and um, maybe should have been a hint. Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> and uh, my my uh, my friends got on ahead of me, and I uh, just kind of fell into the ski ch- lift chair and uh, uh, immediately like both of my skis snapped off. I don't know how that happens. It just does. <laughs> like if you move the wrong way, you just, you, you lose your skis and uh, probably good. That probably saves bones from being broken and ligaments from being torn. Um, but the the point is I was on a ski a chair lift and the person running the lift was kind enough to put the skis on the chair behind me. So I was in front without Mm -hmm. skis Mm -hmm. and my skis were behind me and I had to kind of go get off the chair lift, go down a little slope somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ended up just sliding on my ass down Mm -hmm. the little, down the little thing. uh, And then my skis came down after me. 
Uh, and it didn't get any better from there, folks. Um, at one point, if you were a more accomplished skier, you knew what you were doing, you would kind of turn the corner on the bunny hill. And by more accomplished, you mean just the, have ever just skied have before. have ever skied before. Mm-hmm. You would turn the corner, you'd see three, like, 20... Four year olds from Texas just strewn about on the slope. <laughs> uh, none of us had skis on. They were elsewhere uh, and um, uh, just struggling to survive. And uh, and we got finally got to the bottom, uh, and we just started. It, we basically just stayed in the inside the rest of the time. Just drank your that hot it. cocoa. That was it. We we yeah, just drank the hot cocoa. Had some beer. And, um, and that... I have pictures of you guys just like all scraped up. Oh, I was, bruised. I was wearing like sweatpants too, by yeah, the way. No this snow is, gear. I was not prepared. None uh, of you were. That was the last, the only time I had ever been skiing one time down the slope. And I'll, at this point I can't go ever again, just because I'm 38 years old. Uh, oh yeah. And you know, my legs no. would snap off at the knees. You don't have if enough I ever tried again. So anyway. So. so we did other things in Washington. We did we some did. sledding. Sled. Sledding yes. is fun. Always fun. Uh, nice and, and safe, like yeah, low to the safe, ground. Safe, exactly. Yeah. Walked around a little bit, enjoyed the hot tub. Uh, it was it was it was a great time. It was wonderful. It was fun. But enough about our Christmas family vacation. Mm-hmm. Let's get to the episode. Yes. So we're excited. Uh, we have someone who I've known for quite a while on social media, a, a unbelievable social media presence, so informative. Uh, Dr. Liz, she is an author and speaker, storyteller. Are you just uh, avoiding saying her last name? I, I, I struggle with it. Uh, O'Reardon. <laughs> o- 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 that's right. O'Reardon. Okay. Right? All right. Yeah. Dr. Liz O'Reardon. There you go. Uh, just a, a fantastic uh, physician, uh, speaker, person. Uh, mm-hmm. she, just so, uh, d- just her educational content on social media is is fantastic. She's a writer too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we just had a, a wonderful conversation. Also a cancer survivor. And so uh, her and I had that in common. We'd spoken before about this on her podcast. And uh, it was nice to to just talk about our perspectives on things and um yeah hope you yeah you have in common you're both um you know physicians both surgeons and yeah. also um you know cancer survivors and um that can't be a large group of people that probably fit more that. than you think but i mean it's but obviously still, it's going to be a small you yeah know, the more modifiers you put into that yeah the more right the fewer so people I you're going to get i think it gives a unique perspective that not a lot of people have and so it was really fun to get to hear you guys yeah. share with each other so let's get to it huh? let's do it all right here's dr liz <laughs> Liz, thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, we've talked before. It's about a year ago um, on yeah. on your podcast, and so yes. uh, now I had to have you back on ours. Uh, and the main reason is because uh, I I just had to see what kind of glasses you were wearing. Uh, it's, it's, I was, that's the one thing I remember about you is you have great glasses, and as an ophthalmologist, I, I can't help myself. So well, tell us what, started- what are you wearing here. These are currently 3D printed titanium mesh. See, I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson has my glasses. I go to this amazing (gasps) optician in London who does all the movie stars for films, but he can't get his credits on the screen because he has to pay a ridiculous amount of money. (laughs) Uh But when I was was growing up and started needing glasses, I remember my maths teacher telling me that boys don't make passes at girls who wear glasses. But oh, now gross. glasses are cool and they're my thing. So, uh-huh. um, yeah, I love these. I tell that to, to kids and adolescents, too, whenever they have no. to get into glasses. No, 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 no. I, I tell them that <laughs> glasses are, are, are back they're to... Cool. They're, yeah. they're cool. Be, they're cool. Yeah, they are. <laughs> no, I, I do not tell them, unless I don't want to see any more kids, then I would tell them. But no, I tell them that... Because that's true. Glasses are... They're fashionable now. They're, yeah, they they're, are. I have many a pair that I do need them. I'm wearing yeah. contacts right now, but I've also, tried so hard to get her out of contacts. But I also, can't, they can't. are just like a fun addition to your outfit. They're like an accessory, they like are. jewelry for your face. And so I can my tell. Husband has glasses. Sorry, my husband has glasses he wears when he's having people for meetings without coffee. So when he needs to be stern, he has a certain <laughs> pair of glasses. They just change his personality. <laughs> that do, they, is do they go to the end of ingenious. his nose or do Not they quite. stay up? Not quite. Not quite. Okay. But we're both in bifocals now, so. Well, I can tell, I was going to say, I can tell that you're nearsighted. 
And so you've been, well, how old Ooh, were you when you should started we play wearing guess glasses? The, guess the prescription? Guess the, oh, okay. That's a good, I do this like is this. Party oh, trick. This is a party trick. Um, okay. So I think okay. I was about 12 or 13 when I started wearing glasses. 12 or 13. And I know you're near side. So I would say. Do you need from the side? Uh, Yeah. Tilt your head a little bit the other way. Go the other way. Oh, yeah. I'd say you're probably, you're not that near side. I'd say you're like a minus three. Minus three, 350, something minus like that. Minus three and a half. Yeah. Uh, hey, wow. look at that. Still got oh it. my uh, <laughs> god, that's incredible. <laughs> okay, here's the here's the here's the secret. Uh when yeah. people are nearsighted, uh their the glasses will minimize your face. And so you can see when you look just off the edge of your face mm -hmm. through the lens, yeah. it kind of minimizes it. It's the opposite with people who are far sighted. Oh, okay. it'll, that's why kids, little kids, when they get glasses for the first time, most of the time, or we're talking like three, four, or five years old. A lot of times they're very, really far sighted, so their eyes look huge whenever they put glasses. It's really oh, cute so whenever cute. little yeah. little kids put yeah. glasses on, uh, and that's because they're far sighted glasses. So they maximize. This is anyway. is this interesting to people? I don't it's think. Really interesting. I, I don't I'm know. I, I, I was. I am fast. I usually <laughs> I only fascinate down myself. For a while. <laughs> but three D printed titanium glasses. Yeah, yeah. and they're like for the listeners who don't have video yeah. right now, they're really cool shape too. They kind so of they like, kind like the have frames, a, yeah. a bit missing between the nose and the top of the eyebrow. So yeah, like I've not never seen that. circles. Right, I've and it's super cool. Well, Liz, if you were, we'll we'll, we'll stop talking okay. about glasses okay. for yeah. now. Although <laughs> we could do it for quite a while. If you weren't recording with us, what would you be doing right now? What is your? Because uh, tell tell us what you what you do. What's your kind of day to day like? So I used to be a breast cancer surgeon and I retired in 2019 when my breast cancer came back locally, which meant I couldn't operate anymore. And I was really floored for a while because when you spent 20 years of your life training to be a doctor and you suddenly can't do it, you realize how, how bad your life is because I had no hobbies, no friends. Life was just eat, drink, work. Mm -hmm. And it took some time to work out how I'm going to fill the days because I don't have children. And when you're 43, there aren't many women who don't have children who don't work to meet during the day. But I started writing books. Um, I wrote The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, which kind of answered all the questions I had that I was stupidly searching the internet for at three o'clock in the morning. Mm. And that led to me doing videos on Instagram explaining breast cancer. And that's led to me giving talks all over the world, just trying to help people improve patient care. But my new thing that I started in September is cold water swimming. I'm one of Ooh. those crazy people dipping in rivers when it's freezing yes. cold. <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite? What's your go-to location? There's quite a Do few have pools any and rivers near me. Um, there's a lovely place near Honington, a tiny village in Suffolk, and you can see swans and ducks and cormorants. Mm. And it's just being at one in nature. It's been really helpful. I don't imagine you find any warm places to swim. In England. No, in England. In no, yeah. <laughs> no. Maybe in the yeah. summer, the, the sea will slowly warm up, but generally it's pretty cold. <laughs> so before before you were I guess when you were you know before you got into medicine did all your yeah. training what what were your hobbies what did you what did you like to do I used to sing I used to dance I have a bronze medal in disco dancing thank you very much <gasps> you really what? yes I used that's to swim incredible. I I know I know it's not an Olympic I'm... event but <laughs> no, it's, no it's um, not I had a it's... purple leotard and a sparkly belt and I used to race butterfly so I didn't need shoulder pads in the 80s when I was a teenager I had shoulders out here Oh swimming and then, I thought you were saying swimming. like you raced butterflies I raced butterflies Oh like no. the insects <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing, butterfly racing. <laughs> but I wish it was. No, the stroke butterfly. And then um, the university <laughs> kind of took over. And you kind of stop everything at uni because you're so busy trying to be a doctor. There's no time. Yeah. That's that's what something I when I when I talk to to med students and residents, like try as even if you it's so hard to, but try to hold on to like yeah. that one thing, you know, for I you. Tell it's, them to. it's racing insects, obviously. <laughs> uh but uh but you See, know you it, could take that as racing <laughs> in sex, but we're not talking about that. <laughs> oh dear. This could take we could go on <laughs> many no, sorry. But it, you're right. It's like when yeah. I retired my identity is not as a surgeon. I'm a person and yeah. I should have other things that I do. And medicine somehow takes that out of people. It does. Yeah. That was as this, you know, partner or spouse during yeah. the medical training. That was always something I was. What, was it? With. I'm sure it was very difficult to 
that that moment when you knew like you had to make this decision to to stop operating yeah. to stop practicing and can you tell me a little bit about what that what that moment was like for yeah, you sure so i'd been diagnosed with breast cancer three years earlier when i was 40 and i had chemotherapy mastectomy radiotherapy and it took about six months to get me reskilled to go back to work and that's the whole other conversation was i safe to do it ethically, physically? Could I cope with dealing with patients? But I found a nodule of scar tissue that I just thought was nothing. And um, my surgeon saw it and said, nope, that's cancer. You've got to have it out. And I never went back to work. I thought I would. But as time went on and I realized I've now got a greater risk of it coming back metastatically to kill me, I didn't think psychologically I could cope with breast cancer patients. And all the side effects of treatment meant my left arm didn't work. So I couldn't do my surgery. And I suddenly felt, I can't remember my last operation. Hmm. If I'd known it was my last one, I'd have done everything differently. And that's why lockdown was great because the washing hands was just like scrubbing. Um, mm -hmm. But I really missed being in an operating room with a group of people making something magical happen. That talking, that community, that feeling, wow, we've done this. And when that's taken away from you, it was really, really hard. Mm. But in some ways, it was a relief not to have to treat breast cancer patients having had it myself. And as I became more well known, I thought, well, patients will want to see me and they'll want to talk to me because of what I've been through. And, and it, ethically, that can't happen. It just has to be about them. Mm. But it was really hard giving it up. Yeah. It seems like you, you've you continued the thread, at least, of you're still helping the breast cancer yeah. patients through the work that you're doing now and, you know, potentially helping save lives with all the information, the education you're putting out about, you know, how yeah, to detect fantastic. breast cancer and things like that. And it's it's funny how it started. I used to tweet under my married name of Ariadne, but my maiden name was Ball, thinking the crazy patients can't find me because it was yeah. all this fear <laughs> that you'll get trolled and you don't want patients to know. And then when I was diagnosed, I thought people are going to recognize me because I was treated in a hospital where I worked and my husband, who's a consultant surgeon, works as well. So I just told Twitter and that day changed my life mm -hmm. because patients from all over the world told me how to cope with chemo and what to eat. And suddenly by talking honestly about what was happening to me, I could help hundreds or thousands of people globally instead of the 70 or 100 women I might treat a year. And it was like, wow, this is an incredible tool for educating. And not just patients, but doctors, students, nurses. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Right. And it's it, it's fascinating to me, because I've been through the same thing. You mentioned earlier yeah. how you went through, um, uh, you had to learn, you had to figure out, yeah. you know, how to, how to deal with this, how to get through this treatment. And it's, it's all, it's fascinating that like, we have to do that as physicians. Like we, I mean, you in particular, you've, you've been in that world, but yeah. still there was that, that piece of it that you had to learn on your, on your own, on the fly. And, uh, and yeah. I, I thought I knew everything there was to know about breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I realized I knew nothing because I've never had chemo. I'd never had an operation. I was terrified of having a general anesthetic. It wasn't being scared of waking up. I was just frightened of not being in control. But this is ridiculous. I'm a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And then it's how people treat you because I'm not just a breast surgeon. I've worked in the hospital. My husband's a surgeon. You don't know are you being treated differently by other colleagues and they don't want to come and see you because she's the person in the side room. And that's, it's really hard being on the, the other side when you have a little knowledge. Yeah, and, and all of a sudden, when I had my first cancer surgery, uh, yeah, all of a sudden, uh, anesthesiologist was my favorite person in the operating room, and uh, yeah. um, it's like this, it's like the the, the drugs they have are it's just so wonderful. It's oh, just they are, aren't they? It's this is amazing. <laughs> it's because yeah, you're so it's scared, and then they, and then it's just like you're out, and yeah. Uh, it's um, it's a lot of trust you have to have as, yeah. as a patient. A lot of trust. They're going to take and care you of you. Realize. You're on that gown, naked underneath, on a very small trolley. It It's really hard putting your life in the hands of other people. Mm -hmm. But the scary thing for me was signing the consent form. So we mm -hmm. have to tell patients all the risks, the pros, the cons, things that might happen. But we know they're small. Don't worry about it. But when you're signing a piece of paper saying you might get this, 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 and this, it's like, blimey. 
I had no idea the impact of this form that I just take for granted. It was, yeah, really weird. Because you do it, you do it so often, so many times yeah. in your career. It's just, uh, it yeah, it doesn't seem like an issue. Yeah, it becomes routine as a physician, but then as a patient, it's terrifying. <laughs> exactly. To me, it's just another wound infection, but to them, it may delay radiotherapy. And it's like, oh, okay, I had no <laughs> idea. Right. And when did you when did you decide, okay, you're gonna take all these experiences and you're gonna start writing a book? Because writing a book seems like the hardest possible thing to do. Yeah. And how 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 difficult was that to kind of get over that hurdle of learning how to well, write? I, st I started off by writing a blog because my husband was a tech geek who said I should do one because it, this is back in 2015. And for me, it was a way of explaining to my family what was going on because my brother lived in Switzerland and my parents lived 400 miles away in Scotland. And by just writing what was happening, it was a way of letting everybody know rather than having to deal with phone calls on chemo. And I discovered that I could write well for a lay audience. I have a PhD where you write 500 word paragraphs and sentences and no one understands a word, but I found I could write <laughs> for the general public. And I got so much um, feedback saying, thank you for explaining what's happening. But then on Twitter, I met one of my heroes. She's an incredible professor. She's a GP. Her statistical knowledge got me through my exams. And she messaged me to say we were having chemo on the same day for breast cancer. Mm. And between us, we bought 20 books written by patients because you we were both desperate to find out what it was like to be a patient having treatment. Right. And the scary stuff you find on the internet terrifies me. I'd never been on a breast cancer forum. How ridiculous is that? I had no idea what questions patients were asking. And so the two of us thought we should write a book explaining everything. But it was one of the hardest things I've done. Mm. Not so much talking about my own experiences, but writing it with someone else. She is someone who says the deadline's in January, so I'll write it in July. Let me see your work. And I'm very much, I was going to write it three weeks before the deadline. That's how I roll. <laughs> and it was quite hard working with someone else. But it, we, I'm so proud of how many people we can help through the book. Yeah, that is amazing. I can't imagine doing it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what your uh, clinical notes are were like yeah, as a practicing yeah. physician, but you you spend so much time writing this technical, you know, yeah, and using words that really aren't real words and, no. and sentence structure that that's just that doesn't make sense anywhere outside of our own little bubble of medicine. That uh, it seems, and I you know I've I've tried to do a little writing. It's just like the hardest the hardest thing. I just is like I, look. Let me just make like sixty second skits, and I I can yeah. I can handle that kind of writing. But um, I, I'm just so impressed you know, that you've been able to can kind of transition into that that totally think... different world. I write as if I'm explaining things to my mum or to a friend mm -hmm. or how no, I would explain good. it to a patient who doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps me get into the mindset, assume they know nothing and explain everything literally. And I actually, I'm a geek. I enjoyed the research and fact checking. And I know I say this all the time, but where did that fact come from? And is it really true? Right. You... I think that it's so important too. like the, the, the most successful writers, doctor writers, I think, are those that can take different perspectives. And it seems like you have the clinician perspective, you have the research perspective, and then you have the human being perspective. And that's the one yeah. that I think goes, you know, people forget about that one when they're when they're yeah. talking to their patients. And it's something I talk about all the time. Um, here and everywhere else is you forget what it's like to be a beginner. You forget what it's like to not be the expert in this or to not be a professional in this. Yeah. And you take for granted some of the things that um, that are just basic knowledge to you, but are crucially important for the patient, for you to say yeah. out loud. Um, and so when those things go unsaid, it can be very scary for the for the patient. So I admire that, that, you know, you're able to take those different perspectives and put on those different hats and then everybody benefits. And I think part of it is when I'm telling 10 women a day they've got breast cancer, it has to become routine. I can't yeah. get emotional. I have to go home. And it's almost reminding patients that doctors do this day in, day out. We don't get coaching. We don't get counseling. We might not be the most empathetic at the time. We're trying our best. And it's just getting that balance across. But talking about writing, I've got another book coming out um, next summer, Under the Knife, which is my own memoir as a female surgeon. Because mm, I nice. went through when there were very few women going into surgery. 
the sexual oh. harassment, the bullying, the funny stories that you have, just again to show people what it's like to be inside our world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a couple stories you could share with us? Yeah. So um, I was doing urology, which is, um, how do you explain urology? Um, kid, <laughs> kid, kidney, kidneys and bladders and genitalia. Sorry, I'm having a, a that, I think that gone. probably covers it. Maybe. I, covers it, yeah. I, I don't know how much the kidneys are involved. Is it because you're, then you're bleeding urology. into to, to nephrology a little bit more? It's, but Well, I guess in you know. the, nephrology is the medicine of kidneys, but urology is the surgery of kidneys the, right, and prostate right. and bladder. There that's we go. Right. And, and balls, lots name, of balls. And balls, uh, yeah. And my name was Dr. Ball. Oh, so no. I was known as <laughs> Tess, as in Tess Tickle, for uh. the two years I worked in that hospital. And it was in a tidy hospital in the Welsh Valleys. And I went off to do erectile dysfunction clinics by myself as in like a junior doctor. And I was in this tiny little room and the nurse went to get the next patient. And I was sat in a chair and the knock went on the door. And I thought it was the nurse bringing me a cup of tea. So I put out my hand and I ended up touching this 80 year old man's penis because he'd just come in and dropped his trousers. Oh, and I'm no. not sure which of us was more embarrassed. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, I didn't do that again. <laughs> yeah, did you did you consider a career in urology? I actually really liked it. It made sense. Um yeah. I really liked it, but I didn't like wearing wellies. Um and... You'll have to help us out. What wellies? The shoes. So oh, rub oh, rubber rubber okay. boots. So all the all the surgeons oh, gotcha. wore um like rubber Wellington boots in theater oh, gotcha. because there's so much water and urine splashing around. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am not in medicine at all, and I think bodies are pretty gross. So they are. this is always <laughs> and I and I don't deal yeah, with, I'll stop with that. fluids. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's good. That's partly why I went into breast surgery. There aren't any. Well, I, I say urologists do have uh, some of the best senses of humor in medicine. I've, they do. I've having interacted with with different people, but, but tell us uh, what else? What else you got? I'm sure you have so many. I mean, that is very interesting. You know, background. You know, uh, uh, being a, a woman surgeon. So, um, yeah, what else do you got? What else? What can I say? So there was one time <laughs> I was um, learning to operate in the middle of the night and it was um, a guy had come in whose bowel had perforated. So it hole in his bowel, needed to go to theatre. The registrar was in A&E dealing with another thing. So I went with a consultant and he was really, really good. He said, right, you can open this abdomen. I think, yes, this is really exciting. And he was carefully getting aprons and gloves. And I was like, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm good to go. I don't need anything else. And I gave the knife and he stood back. And I gently opened the skin of the abdomen, which was paper thin because it was stretched because his bowel was full. And a torrent of chocolate milkshake flew out of this guy's tummy and hit the roof because it was under so much what? pressure. And I got covered in liquid shit. And the oh. consultant's there really oh. smug because he'd put on plastic apron and gloves to cover him. He said, you're going to smell shit every time you eat for the next two days until the smell goes oh but you know no. what it was incredible because i got to help him fix it but despite this i still like surgery <laughs> that's if, if you could withstand that <laughs> yeah then, then you know I, it you is the career for you place. yeah yes. you, you kind of know where your lines are and that wasn't it wow <laughs> tell me again what you were wearing when that happened so just a normal pair of scrubs, but generally <laughs> no. when you're when when you're prepping for a procedure, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of blood, like an aneurysm or a bowel perf. You'll put on a long plastic apron underneath your scrub gown, like a waterproof okay. layer to stop gotcha. the shit soaking through the gown to the scrubs. I okay. didn't have that. <laughs> All right. Was that the only think... time you didn't have that? Was that? The, yes. Never <laughs> again. <laughs> I can tell you, I I have never worn one of those either. But I am yeah. also an ophthalmologist, and I've never had to to record uh, blood loss or any kind of fluid I... loss whatsoever. So it's that's outside my world for sure. Were yeah. you wearing at least? <laughs> were you wearing eye protection? Were you wearing glasses? Just glasses. Oh, okay. Oh boy. All right, that's not great. You learn to keep your mouth closed when you gasp. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> where were you? Where You're were you squeezing? <laughs> where were you training? I, I was. I was training in Wales. Um, mm -hmm. I remember squeezing an abscess. A, a patient had a sebaceous cyst on his back, a really, really big, juicy cyst that needed yeah. to be squeezed. And I was obviously behind his back and I lanced it and I squeezed and it covered my face and the wall behind me. <laughs> and my, the junior doctor assisting me was like, he can't know how much mess I'm covered in. 
we're oh. just going to clean this up. And she was like getting me wipes. And I was kind of wiping off my face and cleaning my tongue and scrubbing off the walls yeah. while she was stitching it up. I have a yeah. very, very similar story. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh-huh. This was, yeah, Kristen's... <laughs> I'm dying, dying inside. Here. Sorry, um, Kristen. No, no. This is what she gets for being on it's a medical true. podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, so this was like the beginning of my chief year as a resident. So I was yeah. in my last year residency. And I was like, you know, big shot. You know, I've, I'm the yeah. senior resident, right? And so, you know, the 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 first year residents would would call me in if they weren't sure about something. Mm-hmm. And so it was at the beginning of the year. So they, I was, I got called in quite often and, um, and they called me in for this um, this big kind of like a Chalazian, just a, a you know a a oil filled you know yeah. pocket in the eyelid basically. Yeah. And I you know I was like ah it's, you know it's fine I, I'll handle this you know no big deal and uh, and I I squeezed it and uh, yep it, it it got right face shot just uh, and I had to um, and and again I, up until that point I had I was kind of coming across this. I can, I yeah, can I'm the anything. cool guy, and so I, it was really a, a, a you know, I deserved it. <laughs> Were you wearing I eye had to protection? Play it off. Uh, I, I actually was not, <laughs> ah. and so um, it was a big mistake on my part. I learned a lesson yeah. that day. You uh, only do you it know, once, you, don't you? It's good to be humbled every now and then. Yeah, I think so. Know? I think so. <laughs> Oh man, I, I'm glad somebody does it. I suppose I don't know how yeah. you guys do. Well, you know, it's um, different eye fluids. You know, I think one of the things with medicine and deciding what you kind of doctor you want to be is what what fluids you're okay with exactly. working with. Exactly. Right. One of my professors said, "Pick the body fluid you mind the least." Yeah, and that for makes you, sense. what was it for you? Well, I went into breast surgery, so there are none. You get a sweaty armpit once in a while. She, the one fluid I can't stand is vomit. I can cope with everything else, but vomit I find really, really hard. It's a rough yeah, one. I can't. I, the oil, the oral secretions, the suctioning, the anesthesia. I did like okay. a two-week elective in anesthesia. I could not do phlegm. Anesthesia. You're not into phlegm. Not into it. Can't handle it. Mm. So, is, is this the most fun you've ever had, Kristen? On this. <laughs> This Sorry, is I'm digging real deep she's here. very far away from from medicine and for good reason. I, I don't know what you would do if I was something other than an ophthalmologist who doesn't have to deal with body uh, you fluids. just would be forbidden to talk about it. I think. Yeah, I'm I just wouldn't forbidden. be you're she pretty much she doesn't quite right. <laughs> Even when we had little babies, I mean, I, I made him do all the the body all the body fluid okay. stuff. <laughs> the least step role. possible. He, that was yeah, his job. I like, like, like that. You're yeah. gonna be a doctor. You gotta. You, you're gonna have to handle all of this. Yeah. So, True. Yeah, it's still the How case. Well, signed up for that. <laughs> they did. are How ten old... and seven now. Okay. So does he do all the scrapes when they cut their knees and things? Well, now he's just like, oh, you're fine. Oh, you know. So now I'm nice. back to. Well, we have girls, so they're not. You know. <laughs> They're not in, okay. in, uh, in imminent danger at all times like little boys are. So uh, yeah, they're know. they're more careful. So how 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 big was your um, I guess your residency class? Was it called residency in the UK? I, no, it's... it's not. So the medical school class there were about 150 of us for the five years. Oh, that's a, that's a big class. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay. All Although right. I think they're a lot bigger now. We've increased the number of doctors, but it it was. You knew the people on your dissection table really, really well. Yeah. And how many how many spent... women were in your class, would you say? I think we were about 50-50. Oh, really? Okay. Nice. I Good. think, and, and a lot of places it's actually 60, 40 women to men, but there is yeah. still a large dropout of women. And for whatever reason, family, lifestyle, um, it's a really hard career as a woman because if you are straight, there's not a great dating pool for women in the world of hospital medicine. Not like there is for men. There are lots of nurses and physios and occupational health professionals, but I was single for eight years doing my surgical training. I was the crazy cat lady with two cats. And you meet a guy in a club. So what do you do? Ah, I'm a urologist. What does that mean? (laughs) I spend all day looking at, bye, see ya. Um, And They're lost. They're They're lost. lost. But it's very hard to find a man who can cope with dating a woman who's a surgeon. And who likes cats. Exactly. Well, I didn't have them at the time. They came when I couldn't find a man. See, my husband was my boss, and he asked me out the day I left to move to a different hospital. Problem solved. (laughs) There you go. 
What is he? Is he a physician? Is he? He's a surgeon, He's a surgeon. as well. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. Upper gastrointestinal, so gallbladders and things like that. Oh, gotcha. But doing my junior surgical training, I was there were twelve of us in the year, and two of us were women. Okay. And I didn't work for a female boss until I was three years out from becoming a consultant. So that's the is that an, what's high in the states? Is it resident or attending? Uh, attending. attending. Attending is the so is the the big when boss. I had Three years left of residency, I finally worked for a female attending. I'd only worked wow. for men up until that point. That's that's okay. That's a number. That's a lot of years. That's telling. yeah, yeah. I've so got a you... lot of things to say about that, but that would be a different <laughs> podcast, right? Yeah, let's let's save that for next time. All right, okay. well, let's let's take a, let's take a break, and uh, yeah. and then we're gonna come back with uh, Doctor Liz. Liz, Doctor Word. No, nope. Oh, nope. Doc, no, Doctor Liz. <laughs> Liz, we'll be right back with Liz and we're going to do a, a little activity. All right. Be right back. Big thank you to everybody listening. Spread the love. Share the podcast with everyone. Leave a review and a rating. Be honest. All right. Tell us what you think of the show. Uh, later today, we're going to share some of your own medical stories. You can share yours. Knock, knock, high at human-content.com. We also have Patreon. Uh, come hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We're going to be there. That's right. We You're are there. there. We are there. already there. Uh, we're already there. Yeah. We're commenting. We're, yeah. we're posting. Hang out. We're, we're, hang out with us. Come mm-hmm. on. Uh, early episode access. Check out bonus episodes. Uh, there's we We're doing another monthly show where we <laughs> react to, to medical shows and to, to TVs and movies. And, it, it, uh, do you know. welcome to planet Earth? <laughs> Uh, and also, we have another announcement, uh, Moby. There's a Moby podcast yes. coming to the Human Content Network, a new podcast Super hosted excited. by the iconic musician Moby. At the end of this episode, we'll be sharing a trailer, so stick around for that. All right, let's get back to Liz O'Riordan. All right, we are back with Liz. And uh, Liz, we're going to do something uh, special uh, that's uh, that kind of connects the two of us. So okay. uh, for uh, we we've touched on it already, but um, the the two of us have uh, cancer history. Uh, you with breast cancer, me with testicular cancer, and um, and what I thought we could do is a, a little thing called gray cloud silver lining. And so okay, there are lots of gray clouds, lots of bad thoughts, bad experiences awful things that have to do with the diagnosis of cancer, uh, learning you have cancer, the treatment, the recovery, both physical, mental, emotional, all that stuff. It's, it's gray clouds everywhere. Um, but there are occasional little silver linings, little things that, Oh, because I went through that, I, this has, I have this new experience or I've had this interaction. I've had this I, I dare to say good thing that has come yeah. out of, of this awful situation. And so I thought we could go back and forth and do a few gray cloud. Love it. Silver lining uh, things. So do you want to start? Oh, do you have, yes. do you have, or do you want me to start? I, I'm happy to start if you want. Okay. No, let me, start. let me kick it off. Let me kick it off. Okay. You start. All right. So um, for me, a gray cloud was the nightmare of dealing with the U S health insurance industry, which I had been insulated from as a physician for the most part. There's a few things you have to deal with, but Mm -hmm. as a patient, it's a totally different world. And I'm not going to go into it because that's a whole nother podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that was a huge gray cloud uh, on the phone, just hours, you know, upset, yelling at people and and it's uh um just so many so much time and mental energy dealing with that and trying to get this expensive treatment covered Mm. um but now the silver lining for me is that i understand what my patients are going through and i can connect with them in that way uh of of being like, you know, being able to talk about insurance with them when they have questions, like this is how this yeah. is going to affect you. This is, uh, this is what, you know, you might have to pay. This is how we're going to help you uh, navigate this. And I'm o- more open to that. So that's been a silver lining for me is just having that experience 
I can connect a little bit better with my patients around this horrible issue that we deal with in the U S. So that's, that's one thing that, you know, I've, I think is a, is a net positive, honestly. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give me one? What do you got? So I'd say one was because I was made menopausal to stop me producing estrogen and I had my ovaries out, my libido went overnight. Sex became a thing of the past. Everything's dry and I had no idea how difficult it was to be a young married woman and never want to have sex. Mm. But the silver lining is I found people online who gave me help, who showed me what I can do. And I realized I never talked to my patients about it. I never brought it up. But by writing and talking and podcasting about it, I can help women get their sex life back after cancer. And that feels amazing. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I'd love to know what what Kirsten would say, being as a wife of someone who's had cancer, because you must have these too. Yeah. Uh, Well, similar to to breast cancer, he had, you know, testicular cancer, and that comes obviously with hormone replacement therapy. And so that's been a whole, you know, thing to, that's something that we will live with I've been a bit moody over the last. So yeah, it's always a competition of of whose PMS Uh, is worse today. Nice. (laughs) <laughs> you always win, right? Actually, he can get know. pretty bad he over here. Can... <laughs> he can he can be a little bit uh, a little cranky, a little cranky. Okay, yeah. mm-hmm. you never it's, guess it's, that it's, from your Twitter it's... feed. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, it's been a journey with, uh, and that actually ties in with health insurance for us. Is is uh, I've I've been through so many different iterations of of testosterone. It's it's been it's been a whole thing. Yeah. Um, okay. I've got one. Okay. Okay. So gray cloud, I have lost both of my testicles and that's obviously comes with a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, but, uh, the silver lining is that riding a bike has never been more comfortable. <gasps> oh, yes. I hate you. It's, 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 <laughs> it's great. It's like, I, I don't even, like, I don't have any concern about uh, my child kicking the soccer ball in the wrong place. Uh, yeah. it's, it's fine. I, you know what? I'm like Iron Man down there. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you can't, you can't hurt me. And, uh, so there you go. Like, that's, I feel yeah. like something. That's, that's something, right? Okay. Well, yeah. I'm going to stick on the same thing. I had a mastectomy and an implant. Um, but radiotherapy made it shrink and shrivel up to the side. And I had it removed when my cancer came back. And I remember spending weeks going around stores crying, thinking, how on earth am I going to disguise the fact I have one breast? I had chronic pain, so I couldn't wear a bra and a prosthesis. But six months later and now, I realize I don't give a toss what anyone thinks. And I will walk around without a bra on, lopsided. I don't care. And it's given me that freedom to think my breasts didn't define me. They didn't make me a woman. That's that awesome. time to get to yeah. that point. Yeah. How long did it take you, do you feel like, to navigate that? I think that? a good six months to a year. I wouldn't let my husband look at me. I would get dressed in the dark and turn around. I didn't want him to see the scar. And it wasn't pretty because I'd had surgery before and two lots of radiotherapy. But now I've posed topless with some photographs. I don't mind. This is It's just me. I now accept my body. But it does take time. I, I have breast you envy, those though. On- <laughs> yeah, I will look at oh, women in in bars, and I was like, "I'm not leering at you because I fancy it." It's just such a pretty cleavage. I miss mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you don't do this. Well, maybe you do do the same <laughs> to other men's testicles. Oh, um, I don't routinely. <laughs> do you, you uh, crotch watch uh, with envy? Uh, no. It's, it's... <laughs> Actually, it's quite the opposite uh, uh, because sometimes it looks quite uncomfortable, uh, you know, yeah, to, got to, you. to wear, you know, jeans and, you know, it's, mm. it's you're kind of always having to, to yeah. kind of re, uh, readjust yourself and uh, yeah. know, not as much of a problem for me anymore. That's great. But the other <laughs> thing, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of men who have a testicular cancer who, who do, I never really had that, uh, you know, difficulty with accepting my body and the fact yeah. that I did not have testicles anymore. A lot of, and, and I think part of that is just where I was in life and with a yeah. very supportive family and everything. And, um, and, but you know, testicular prosthesis is a, is a oh, big great, deal. And, aren't they? and yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an option. It's an option. It's yeah. good. It's a good option. It just really depends on the person, right? It's, it's all, it's all about uh, what you're comfortable Definitely. with. 
Um, Ooh, that could be really fun though. Like if you have a prosthesis and people don't necessarily do you want to know that about you. You could do whatever well, you want, no, right? Just yes. like having them kick you and just be <laughs> unfazed. Do it again. And, do it again. Yeah, Let me show that could you be how really... hard I am. That's, yes. that's a, America's Got Talent. It could uh, be a really audition. fun party yes. trip. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, that's that's I didn't uh, know, think this would go in this direction. <laughs> You'd Let's have see. to strap the penis out of the way though to protect it. It's true. Like, that's true. Yeah. That. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. the penis is it, it can it yeah. withstand a bit more a uh, blunt force. Yeah. I would say. I'll um, take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kristen, we've gone down this line again. <laughs> I mean, um, okay. I'm used to uh, it. That's, is it my turn? Do I have? Yeah, it's your uh, turn. I think so. Okay, I, I have one more. I have one more. Okay. Um, Okay, here we go. So hormone replacement, we talked about that. Uh, it's been a challenge. Lots of ups and downs. Mostly lots of downs. I can, well, yeah. lots of downs. <laughs> and I can tell, like I can tell when I'm getting low and I need to go back in and so get more. So can I? I know, yeah. It's everybody can. Uh, and then being up when you're up high, oh, it's great. It's fantastic. So that uh, those ups and downs are um, uh, though th that's a, a great cloud for me. It's, it's really frustrating to have to deal with that. The, uh, the silver lining, though, is that because I'm already on testosterone replacement, when I'm 60, I'm going to have a great testosterone level. It's, I don't, I don't <laughs> have are, to worry about it. I've got it. Full I've, head I'm of set. hair, virile, all your muscles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally it's, controlled. It, it's great. And so, I, you know, something to look forward to, I suppose. Um, Can you get you know, them to keep you on the full adult dose, or do they drop it down with age? Or do you say I get no? To I do want whatever the full I want. Okay? <laughs> oh, really? It's whenever ah. you've lost them both to so cancer. It's that's the your, uh, <laughs> your poor wife has to deal with these mood swings for the rest of your life. Well, if we can even it out a little bit, it'd be it'd be, it'd be good. good. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, yeah. But another silver lining from that, though, is you now understand what it's like a little bit to be a woman. The ups and the downs mm -hmm. and the So when you go through the menopause, he's got to lay all the care on you. There you go. I know yeah. very, very little about what it's like to be a woman. But you have a taste. You have a taste. Uh, Just like when you yeah, had yeah. Your, your electric bra. Don't give me too much credit here. No, I'm not. I still think, <laughs> of course. Yes, but... my electric bra was another yeah. uh, instance with the cardiac arrest. I, I wore the yes. external defibrillator. And so you got to understand what that is like and, and these hormone you know, fluctuations. Like Wonderful you understand. feeling taking that thing off at yeah, the end of the day. Exactly. Because breasts are heavy. How much do you think a 36C weighs? Oh my gosh! Ooh, good question. Yeah, that's great. One one thirty six C breast. One. How much do you think it weighs? Just one. Uh, three pounds. We're using. The, we're using. We're not using oh, the no. metric system oh, here. Oh no! I, <laughs> I can't do <laughs> So okay, half half a kilo. Uh, yeah. uh, what uh, that's is probably that? about a, a large horrible. bag of sugar. Yeah. yeah that, a large um, bag of sugar. I would have guessed less than that. Five hundred grams is. So really? for a woman's to 36C, she's got a kilo of weight strapped to her chest. Wow. That that sounds like a lot. That's not a... <laughs> Someone's We're got really to work out what the kilo pound conversion is. But they're yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, we... Uh, we should have we should have learned about the metric, uh, system. The metric system a little bit more. <laughs> well, uh, it's a better system anyway. It is. But that is a lot. Oh, that is oh, a lot. Let's see. What does that say? Oh, Aaron, our producer uh, says uh, one kilo is two pounds, a little over okay. two pounds. Okay. Is a kilo. And that's so, just the one side. No, that's that's the two. That's both. That's, kilo, that's okay. kilo lot, for both. Though. That's so, so I was lots. right. One. No, I said three pounds. You were, you were over. I was yeah, over. That's Sorry. still, I mean, but over the course that of your life, lot. though. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. You get back lot. pain. And that's neck just a pain. seat, right? That's yeah. just a I mean, C cup. Yeah. yeah. I've taken breasts off that have weighed more than two pounds each. Oh, wow. Well, we have touched on a lot of things during this conversation. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get to hear her last one yet. I oh oh that's right. Do you have one more? Yeah yeah. Oh I yeah. Do. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I think for me, a gray cloud was losing my social network. When I spent eighteen months at home, away from work, having treatment, feeling miserable, quite isolated, it was really, really, really lonely. But by tweeting and blogging, I discovered friends, many of whom I've met in real life, who've become really, really close. And it's amazing what friendships you can develop just by reaching out to people. So that's been a huge silver lining. And even now, so my mum died a week ago and the messages of sympathy, sympathy and support I've had from complete strangers has just been incredible. 
I wouldn't have had that without breast cancer. I wouldn't be talking to you without breast cancer. Mm -hmm. That's got to be a silver lining. Come on now. (laughs) You've got to raise your bar. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But it is, you know, uh, there's a lot of people complain a lot about social media and, um, you know, some of the negativity and things, but there's a lot of just community, the the community you can build. Yeah, a real community. There's good stuff out there. It really yeah. is. You just have to, you know, you have to find it. You have to it. dig have through to all the it. nonsense. And um, yeah. once you find it, though, it's it can it can really make a difference in in your life. So, um, yeah. I have a question for you guys. That listeners may may wonder. Um, yeah, what is it? One thing I you know I hear a lot is people um, feel like they don't know what to do to help, and I think that contributes to that isolation that you mentioned. And so, you know, as um, people who have lived with cancer. What is helpful? What can people do if they want to support someone in their life that that is going through cancer? That's a good question. That is a great question. And the first thing people say is, what can I do to help? It's like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I've never had cancer before. No, yeah. I wouldn't know. I think <laughs> the most important thing for me was just to stay in touch. Mm. Just to send someone a text or a card in the post. And I've got alarms on my phone reminding me to send cards to people. Just that constant bit of contact saying, hi, I'm thinking of you. You don't need to reply, but you're in my thoughts. Because after the initial, I've got cancer, a lot of people run away Mm -hmm. and you kind of find out that some friends can't cope. And then it's practical stuff. Just turn up and change my sheets or fill Mm -hmm. the freezer or walk the dog. Stuff I'm too polite to ask you to do, but don't have Mm -hmm. the energy to do myself. That's what I would say. Or bring a meal or, you know. Exactly. And and that's or take my husband out for drinks so he's got some company away from me <laughs> because I think it was all about yeah. me. I had a house yeah. full of flowers and cards and presents, and my husband, who was incredible, supported me through it and said he felt impotent because as a doctor he couldn't make me better. Mm. No one's sending him a card. No right. one's taking him out. And I, th- I mean, you must have felt that too. You need you need absolutely. That support just as I much always as he say does. It, it happens to to, to both the partner you. too. Yeah, it's not in our and bodies, but it happens to us. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that logistical piece, that practical piece, is is something yeah. really easy that everyone can do. That I hear over and over again from people, and was certainly yeah. true for us. I like would, would people agree, are worried. Yeah. I think that they're going to overstep, or that they they won't do it the way you want it done or something like forget no. about all that polite. just come in and help <laughs> yeah just come and say i'm doing your laundry yeah exactly exactly don't give us a choice because we'll tell you no that's not necessary if you do I'm fine i'll cut yeah right. well, exactly do. just that come do it yeah be, yeah be like a mom like an overbearing yeah. mother <laughs> and just come in and <laughs> take care of it <laughs> overbearing mother but just tone it back just a tiny Maybe just a bit, bit. And, a bit. Then, and then and then and then that's perfect yeah. <laughs> Well, Liz, tell us, uh, so you, you talked a little bit about what you're working on. Uh, just let, let people know where they can find you and, and what you got coming up. So my website is www.liz.iridan.co.uk, I think. Sorry, mental slash. Um, if you put my name into Google, you'll kind of find me. And God, that makes me sound so, I don't mean to be like that. Um, no, it's I fine. It's I just true. I still think I live in the country and don't really do much. Um, on Twitter, <laughs> I'm Liz underscore O'Riordan. And on Instagram, I'm at O'Riordan Liz. And I spend a lot of time tweeting, educating videos about what cancer is really like. My book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, is available on Amazon in the States. And that's basically every question you'd ever want to know. And it covers not just cancer, but mental health, physical health, depression, everything. My memoir is coming out in the summer called Under the Knife, and that can be pre-ordered through Unbound. And my next version of the podcast is coming out in January. And the first guest is my mum. So my mum died just before Christmas, but she had her arm amputated in the summer because of a metastatic bone cancer. And she christened herself the one arm bandit. And I got to talk to her for an hour about what her life was like. So she's going to be my first guest. And that's called Don't Ignore the Elephant. That is that's wonderful. A that's wonderful thing special. to do, you know, at the at the end of her life like that. Yeah, and so really lucky to I'm have sorry it. for your loss. And uh, but it's you've done you're just continue to do wonderful things. I love your social media presence and uh, for the education that you're you're giving oh, to people out you. there. So my mom said I share too much, but to me it's just mm-hmm. reaching out and being honest and saying shit happens and this is how you cope. And if I talk about it, then maybe someone will know they're not alone. A bit like yeah. what you exactly. guys are doing. We need yeah. it. We need it. So we thank do. you so much for joining us. And yeah, thank uh, you. It's, it's been a pleasure. And we'll talk again soon. Definitely. All right. Let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories that were sent in by you, 
the listeners. All right, we got a couple good ones today. Uh, they're always good ones. I don't know they why are. I keep saying that. Yeah. Every single time I tell you it's going to be a good story. Of course it's going to be a good story. You guys sent them. <laughs> okay, so our first one comes from Shiva. It says, hi, I am Shiva from India. When I posted in my first rotation of pediatrics, my senior asked me to take a venous blood gas of a newborn and it was really difficult to get the sample out of the neonate. So that's, you know, putting in a syringe, pulling up. Yeah, very tiny. Yeah, very, very tiny neonate. Very, very small. I don't know how people do that. After many tries, somehow we managed to get it. Before running the sample, when I was trying to push all the little air bubbles out of the syringe, I accidentally pushed too hard and the entire sample splashed on the notice board over the machine and everywhere else around. Oh, no. I must tell you the Picasso art I created still <laughs> lies on the notice board and leaves many people passing by in wonders. <laughs> How I wish my senior was wearing a unicorn headband that day. I hope the child is doing okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the child is fine. They're fine. And, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm glad we need to talk about the cleaning skills of mm. of the the fact that it must have been quite a mess to not be able to get it totally uh, cleaned up there but um uh it's uh not great i feel bad for you shiva i hope you've been able to kind of you know recover well you left that. your mark anyway uh, hey the point is you're able to get uh a, a, a sample from a neonate like that's that's something. That's 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 something. pretty good. There's no way I. I could, don't think I could either. I, I'd be better than you at it, probably. Oh well, we don't know about that, but um, I guess we'll never know because I <laughs> no one no wants me going anywhere near a neonate. Um, so, uh, thank you, Shiva, for that story. All right, second story comes from Katarina. It says one random story popped into my mind: twelve-hour weekend shift, triplets born on a Sunday, insane number of referrals in a district general hospital. I worked as a pediatric uh, senior house officer then, which we just looked up actually, because mm -hmm. this is a UK kind of terminology, mm -hmm. and that's it's kind of like a resident, like a like an intern, somebody uh, somebody on the junior yeah, level, uh, on the junior level, um, a little bit. So the lowest of the she says, uh, Katarina says the lowest of the rank in the UK. She said um, our consultant brought bought us chocolate bars to thank us and feed us, and somebody. Bend hers, threw them away. Threw them away. Mm -hmm. Threw them another. We're we're figuring out the yeah. the the, the terminal. So somebody threw away her half eaten chocolate bar. I mean, that's just cruel. That in any had, environment that she had temporarily le temporarily left unattended at the nursing station. Um, she found it, fished it out of the hospital trash can, and ate it. Oh my! She still has no regrets. <laughs> And uh, I don't blame you, Katerina, for not having regrets. I would, you don't realize, like when you're like at that level and you're working so many hours, like 24 straight hours, like er, mm -hmm. you would do, you sometimes, need any sometimes you'll of light do anything to like just, just to eat something. And mm -hmm. so I absolutely, I've heard of people, I don't, I definitely don't recommend this. Please do not eat uh, leftover food off of patient trays, but it, does happen from time to time mm. uh and so there's really no rules you know, other than you, know these... you don't eat something that was on the floor i'd rather eat something that was like kind of like sitting on the top of a trash can what than on the floor what would be in a hospital trash can though that would be my question well it depends on the trash what, can what is your chocolate bar adjacent to this this may have been trash can? this may have been kind of like a george costanza situation that's what i'm thinking right? of yes where it's it's just sitting very gently just on, on top. top of something uncontaminated you have to assume mm -hmm. uh by the rest of the refuse mm -hmm. around it you know you know you guys work in hospitals right you we know, try not to um, think about that sick the, we, people we can always there. blame the sleep deprivation sure that's that's true so katarina uh you know, you you did what you had to do to survive. Yes. Okay. And so I, I can't don't fault blame you, you for that. It's okay. You're fine. I'm sure you, hopefully you did okay after you ate your trash. <laughs> yeah. Candy. We didn't get to hear if anything happened afterward. <laughs> so send us, those are great. We love those stories. Uh, send us more. All right. Send us our stories. Knock, knock high at human dash content.com. Well, we had so much fun with that episode. I hope you liked it. Uh, it was uh, it was wonderful again to talk to Doctor 
Liz O'Reardon. Yes, O'Reardon. she is a lovely person. Go check her out on her social media. Definitely medias. do. Honestly, it's, it. it's a it's a great resource uh, for everything for kind of human connection, education. A few Everybody jokes in has there. been or will be a patient of something. You get to hear so about. You get to hear some for everyone. Some uh, some UK terminology. Mm-hmm. And her accent is just That's great. Mwah! Yeah, we love Chef's it. Chef's kiss. Just, uh, just uh, fantastic. So you can send us your stories at knockknockhigh at human-content.com. Uh, let us know, uh, again, what you thought of the episode, what you thought of the game. Yeah, every every episode I try to come up with a little game, a little something we play, If you an activity, yeah. If you have a, an idea for something, let me know. I would love to hear. It's, it's kind of... Sometimes it's hard to come up with these things. I try. I try. I do my best. I do. I really do. Kristen helps as well. Uh, but we'd love to hear uh, some uh, ideas from all of you. Uh, so email us whatever you want to talk about. Email us again. Knock knock at human dash content dot com. Uh, visit us on our social medias. We have. We're on Twitter. Uh, we're on uh, TikTok. We're on. The other one. YouTube. <laughs> that's the that's the one. Uh, and uh, you can also. Hang out with us and our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thank you to all the great listeners leaving wonderful feedback and awesome reviews. We appreciate it. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, hey, we might give you a shout out. All right. Like Yadaya on Apple said, uh, I became acquainted with Dr. and Lady G just before the pandemic. They have some stuff to say. <laughs> you sure do. And I'm delighted to listen to them. Thank, we, <laughs> we do have we have lots of stuff to say. Uh, we're just scratching the surface here. All right. So uh, also, uh, somebody else said uh, 2023 has just gotten better. Uh, well, that's well, that's great. Uh, it's, uh, it's we're only a few days into it, but uh, uh, I'm glad that there was already room for improvement uh, just right off the bat mm-hmm. there. So uh, our episodes can be found on YouTube. Full episodes go up every week on YouTube at D Glock and Flecken on my page. Uh, Patreon has tons of cool perks, bonus episodes. You can where we react to medical shows and movies. Hang out with the Knock Knock High member community. We are active in it. We're Maybe there. I should start posting embarrassing pictures of you there. That might be good. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like that idea. Okay, uh-huh. sure. You know, yeah, if you want to see that. Uh, although I, <laughs> I don't think there are any embarrassing photos of me. Ooh. Uh, at, on the with Patreon, you get early ad-free episode access, interactive Q and A, live stream events, a lot more is coming out. Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken, or go to our website Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out. Now we have some catching up to do, everyone. All right, this is the first episode we're recording after we've launched the Patreon, and we're overwhelmed with the response. We got a lot of new members here. Uh, Tarcy P, Beth W, Joyce O, Julia T, Reese M, Ethan B. I'm really good at saying names, by the <laughs> way. Uh, uh, oh, I, I shouldn't have said that too soon. Cap, Captain Maine <laughs> Waring. Captain Waring. Yeah, Cap, you, know, you know who you are, Captain Maine Waring. Uh, Leah S, Ian P, Lisa B, Ellen J, Tucker P, Kelly B, Maddie M, it's like a sing song, kind of mm-hmm. like a, yeah, you know, a Jessica H, Sophie B, Jacob A, Chris M. Oh, I, I didn't you gotta go down to your base. Um, shout outs to all the Jonathans. The Jonathans, you know who you are out there Patrick, Lucia C, Joy N, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Abby H, Stephen G, Roskbox, Jonathan F, and Marion W. Thank you all. Patreon Roulette. Shout out to Claudia H for being Ooh, a patron. You went Spanish with that one. Cl- Claudia. 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 <laughs> Claudia. <laughs> I, d- I did not do that on purpose. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. We are your host, Will and Kristen Flannery, a.k.a. The Glock the and, and Fleckens. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Liz O'Reardon. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, Shanti Brooke. Jason, our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omar Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockenflecken.com or reach out to us at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. See, I, I just went... I, went, I saw that. I just kind of yeah, like yeah, improvised. Yeah, you know, I'm just, just, just I'm feeling it. Go where I'm it feeling. goes. Um, Knock Knock High is a human content production. And now here is the new 
Moby trailer for his new podcast. Hi, I'm Moby, and this is Moby Pod. Well, to be honest, this is a trailer for Moby Pod. So I've been making music and art and doing all sorts of things for most of my life, and I have decided to go where many people have gone before. I'm making a podcast. I know I'm not reinventing or inventing the wheel, but I love talking. I'll be joined by my co-host, Lindsay Hicks, and we will be interviewing tons of people, artists, musicians, actors, philosophers, and we'll talk about animals and spirituality and music and existentialism and various apocalypses and puppies and naked mole rats and anything and everything. So please feel free to subscribe and we'll be releasing a new episode every other week and hopefully we'll talk to you very soon on Moby Pod. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.